Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily's The Sidebar, taking you inside the courtrooms of high-profile and notorious cases from across the country. I'm your host, Joshua Ritter. I'm a criminal defense lawyer based here in Los Angeles and previously an LA County prosecutor for nearly a decade. In this week's episode, we're going to try to do something a little bit differently. Usually we like to cover cases that are currently in the news from a legal perspective, but today we will be taking a deeper dive into cases with a view towards the forensic science involved in solving the cases and presenting that evidence in court. First, we're going to talk about the brutal killing of eight family members in Pike County, Ohio, allegedly motivated by a custody dispute turned deadly, plus the autopsy of Tammy Daybell, whose death was initially deemed to be natural, but she was exhumed after her husband, Chad Daybell, and his new wife, Lori Vallow, were implicated in the disappearance of Lori's children, a really tragic case. And finally, the slaying of a woman in Atlanta Park who suffered 50 stab wounds, and one year after her death, no killer or motive has been determined. Uh, the reason we are uh, having this special episode today is we are joined by Joseph Scott Morgan, a former medical examiner, an expert in applied forensics, and host of the Body Bags podcast. Welcome, Joseph. Thanks for having me, Josh. Good to be here with you and your fans. Absolutely. Uh, before we jump into these cases, give us, I talked a little bit about your background, but tell us a little bit about uh, your, your background and the current position that you have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm a Louisianian by birth uh, and started my career uh, with the Jefferson Parish Coroner's Office in uh, the New Orleans metro area. So for me, living in arguably one of the greatest port cities in the world uh, as a young investigator um, uh, with a coroner down there, I was privy not just to see things that happen on the street, street crimes and that sort of thing, but also international stuff that came in, you know, that rolled in off the boats and put you in an interesting position, um, you know, from the perspective of investigation, getting through language barriers and also trying to uh, understand international law a little bit sometimes and even admiralty, uh, which is kind of huh. weird. <laughs> uh, and it, it was just a great training ground. And so I was there for roughly six years and I was an investigator there with the coroner. And when I started out, uh, tell my students back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, uh, I um, back then, if you worked as a medical legal death investigator, which is what I was, the eyes and the ears, if you will, of, of the coroner in the field, um, you were also mandated uh, to uh, work in the morgue. And so I became a pathology assistant. Now, I guess at the end of my career, I wound up doing about 7,000 autopsies or wow. assisting 7,000. And, and I always tell my kids, you know, look, um, out of every classroom, uh, every penny I've ever spent on tuition, the best classroom I was ever in was the morgue. Uh, particularly for you know my area of expertise, medical legal death investigation, and you learn more there than you you ever will sitting in a classroom. Uh, and so uh, we were a very small shop. Um, you know there were when I got there there were only three investigators, and two of us also did autopsies. I worked at night as an investigator during the day as as a path assistant, and. Um, you know, on average, I would roughly assist in over 600 autopsies per year. Wow. And you can do the math behind that and really understand it's, you know, there's an old adage in, in medicine where they talk about, um, particularly at like LA County or a place like what used before, uh, before Katrina Charity Hospital in New Orleans or Cook County, uh, it's called see one, do one, teach one. And so it's like, they're going to throw you in to the mix and you got to catch up if you don't you know you're going to be you know sucking the tailpipe because it's <laughs> it's it comes at you fast and furious there's no time to wait so you got to learn on the on the job and then <clears throat> after i was there for about six years i was offered the position of senior investigator with the fulton county medical examiner's office in atlanta georgia and i wound up staying the vast majority of my career there, you know, roughly 14 to 15 years and eventually transitioned um, into academia uh, where 
Um, I spent about a decade, if I've got any veterans in the in the audience, um, I was at the University of North Georgia, which is one of the six senior military colleges in the nation, like the Citadel and VMI and Texas A&M, Virginia Tech, Norwich, and then North Georgia, but strictly an army school. It's up in the Blue Ridge Mountains, home of the Ranger Mountain phase. Um, I was there for about a decade, started the forensics program there. And now I'm in Alabama, uh, right on the I-20 corridor. Um, I guess for everybody that has ever flown and probably everybody can identify with this, I'm about 90 miles from the Atlanta airport. I guess, heading out of Alabama, I mean, heading out of the Atlanta area and, you know, down the I-20 corridor. And you know the old adage about the Atlanta airport, if you're going to, if you're on the way to hell and you have changed planes, you'll have changed planes in Atlanta. So, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, that's, that's kind of where I am. Uh, again, back in the Appalachian Mountains, beautiful campus, Jacksonville State University in Alabama. And we have an applied forensics program here. And I'm the distinguished scholar of applied forensics here. So, you know, that's that's what I've done, you know, my entire life. I was one of the youngest medical legal death investigators in the country when I started out. I had no business doing what I was doing. Um, and it's all I've ever done uh, other than teach. And the two are kind of hand in hand now, you know, it's hard to separate one. I, I can't remember where one ends and one begins really, but I love teaching. Glad I don't have to be on call and running calls at night and being away from my family and that sort of thing and love teaching and love what I'm doing. That's fantastic. Well, we will be calling upon that vast experience of yours uh, in discussing these cases. So let, I'm, I'm excited to jump into these with you. Uh, let's first talk about um, Pike County, Ohio. Yeah. In April of 2016, eight members of the Roden family were shot across three homes and a camper in Pike County, Ohio, roughly 50 miles from Columbus. The victims were seven adults and a teenage boy. They included Christopher Roden, senior, 40 years old, his ex-wife, Dana Roden, Dana, pardon me, Roden, 37. Their three children, Clarence, 16-year-old uh, Christopher, and 19-year-old Hannah. Clarence Roden's fiance, 20-year-old Hannah Gilly, uh, Christopher Roden's senior brother, 44-year-old Kenneth Roden, and a cousin, 38-year-old Gary Roden three young children were left unharmed. So it, it basically essentially wiped out this entire family. The murder shocked residents and led to one of Ohio's most extensive criminal investigations. Interestingly, the discovery of marijuana growing uh, operations at a number of the locations led to initial speculation that the killings were drug related. However, in November of 2018, several members of the Wagner family, a prominent family in Pike County were arrested. Jake Wagner, George Wagner III, Angela Wagner, and George Wagner IV were all charged in the murders. Prosecutors allege the killings were motivated by a custody battle over the daughter of Jake Wagner and Hannah Roden. The majority of the victims were shot multiple times, with the Wagners allegedly using homemade silencers to kill the victims in their sleep. Jake Wagner pled guilty to eight counts of aggravated murder five years after the killings. In exchange for the plea, prosecutors will reportedly drop the possibility of the death penalty. Jake's mother, Angela Wagner, also pled guilty to helping to plan the murders. So an incredible, uh, devastating case. Um, I know it's something, Joseph, that you've been following closely. W what is it about this case that fascinated you? Uh, well, first off, I think, I think the nature of where it happened um, it's in rural America, you know, kind of a forgotten corner of the world. People don't really, uh, aren't really aware that this place exists. I've been there now. I've been out to the scenes and uh, scenes where the homes were, which I'll get to that in a second. Um, and it reminds you a lot. It's very bucolic looking, beautiful, rolling green hills, farmland. Uh, some of the most beautiful soil you've ever seen, you know, for growing crops and whatnot. Um, and it's right in the foothills of Appalachia. And it's, if, if folks will take a look at a map, it's, it's essentially in Southeast Ohio and Pike County itself is one of the poorest counties in all of Ohio. 
which would make it one of the poorest counties in Appalachia, which is really saying something. I'm in the southern bit of Appalachia where, where my school is now. And it, it's not too dissimilar from where I live now. Um, people are salt of the earth. They, uh, they live a hand to mouth existence up there. There's not a lot of jobs. And so that was the case with the Rodents and the Wagners. You know, you had mentioned, um, you know, essentially the Wagners who are, are charged and uh, a couple of them are about to be tried coming up pretty soon. And they, they possess vast land holdings up there and they've been up there for, you know, for decades, you know. Um, you can almost throw a rock and hit West Virginia or Kentucky from there and it's right uh, it's right to confluence where, you know, those three states come together along the Ohio River. And it's very isolated, Josh, very, very isolated. And that was one of the things that really drew me to it because, you know, when you hear about mass, mass homicides, um, many times you'll think about in uh, large urban areas or that have access to certain services, you know, that in dwell approximation to a large city. They didn't have that. And just imagine this, the scope. But you did a fine job of talking about, you know, this these four locations, which is bizarre in and of itself, yeah. you know, yeah. where you've got essentially four mobile dwellings um, that were hit um, not simultaneously, but kind of falling like dominoes. There was a tremendous amount of planning that went into this. And three of the homes, the actual trailer homes, all sat on the same road. And this is not some place that you wind up by accident. Okay. It's not like right. it's on the way to Cincinnati, it's on the way to Columbus, or it's on the way to Louisville. You purpose to be there. And so you, you know, uh, initially they thought that. Um, there was a huge volume of weed that was going through here and being produced. And people had put out this this kind of interesting narrative that it was, you know, somehow related to Mexican dr drug cartels. And they soon found out that, that that wasn't the case. But early on, um, I think he's governor now, DeWine, uh, but he was AG DeWine at the time when all of this went down, Mike DeWine. He knew that he was going to have to call in resources, and they had to. They had to bring this, you know, bring the resources in. And what's really fascinating about this, and I think that certainly your attorneys in 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 the audience will find this interesting. Josh, they actually picked these scenes up, yeah, and towed them away. That, that that's and, a, a fascinating and, part of this to me. And I, and please <laughs> please get into why and, that decision oh, was made. Oh my and, God, it, it's it's. It's incredible, and we're talking. We're not talking about trailer homes that had just been dropped down in the last, you know, year or two. We're talking right. about stuff that was stubbed in. You had, you know, sewer lines running to it, electrical lines, security cameras. There were hot houses there. There were outbuildings. I mean, these gigantic outbuildings and rusty old shells of cars that they had to kind of navigate these things around and of course the property itself undulates and very difficult to get it out and when you think about that from a forensic standpoint if you're going to attempt to process these these scenes it becomes kind of a nightmare situation and a lot of us would you know and I've talked about this with with my colleagues that are in forensics and whatnot. And, you know, some of the things that we've come up with or, you know, how do you maintain, you know, one of the things that we talk about in, in forensics is kind of the pristine nature of the scene. I mean, that's, sure. that's a big deal. And I know you've heard that in court, you know, one of the, you know, uh, how protected was the scene? Well, just imagine if you will, I mean, all, I think everybody can identify with being on an interstate highway and you've got, you know, a wide load coming through with escort cars and everything, you're having to pull over and this thing's rumbling down an interstate. Now that's an interstate. Can you imagine a country lane, uh, maybe, you know, bouncing down unimproved roads, hitting potholes. And so we're talking about a case that involves multiple uh, gun gunfire related deaths. I mean, gun, yeah, multiple gunfire related deaths with multiple gunshots. Anything that you might be looking at relative to trajectories, You've opened the door now for a wise a wise defense attorney to say, well, how do you know that all of this stuff was studied in 
uh, con- in its contextual for initial format. I'm going to go know, ahead and say you don't even need that wise of a defense attorney to, to be able to cross examine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you on you that. really yeah. don't. I, I don't know. So a lot of people say first year law student. You know, they always <laughs> right. throw that out. And I don't know about first year law student, but it it doesn't require somebody that's very sophisticated. I know I'm not sophisticated, but I looked at this and I thought, gee whiz, this was really a roll of the dice. Yeah. You know, and I, I'm I'm fascinated to see if this comes up in trial. I can't imagine how it wouldn't, but yeah. So, so they moved the homes before any analysis was done of the scene. That was that was my understanding. They they remained very tight lipped about this, Josh. As you can wow. imagine, I think they had assistance. Of course, the feds got involved. You've got multiple firearms. You're and you know right you were when you mentioned any time you drop that term, uh, homemade uh, suppressor automatically you know that's going to activate you know the the antenna of the atf are going to go up immediately not that they right. wouldn't already but you're going to call on the resources of an organization like atf and certainly the fbi and any other you know uh, alphabet you know uh, uh, agency within the feds that have an interest in this sort of thing so i i think my just from my for my own personal curiosity i'm curious to know if there were federal agents that were whispering in their ear you know that were saying oh. you know you might want to consider doing this but famously and this is kind of goes to another issue uh there was a great photo that was taken of the location where these trailers were taken back to and it, it, the only way i can really describe it is it looks like an old airport, like with airport hangars. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I would think about, you know, like in my context for New Orleans, I would think about a place where we, where they, they store Mardi Gras floats, these big, big places. And somebody, I think it was an AP photographer, took a picture of the gate that leads into this area. It wasn't locked. <laughs> and that yeah. was in plain view of the general public. And again, that's that's something, you know, that perhaps I can't imagine that that would escape the view of somebody that's defending one of these individuals. What, what do you know why the decision was made to go through these? I mean, l- like you said, just the logistics alone of doing it, of moving these types of homes is it, not an easy thing. Was there I, I got to imagine somewhere somebody felt there was a compelling reason to do this. Have you stumbled acro- oh, across that I reason? Have. Honest to God, Joshua, I have not. I'm still scratching my head over it. I I would, you know, the first thing that popped to mind was, you know, this was early on in the investigation. I was thinking, you know, well, maybe they were fearful of cartel involvement. And this is, like I said, it's very isolated, very isolated. They don't have a lot of money. Okay. It's not like LA County. Right. um, Where you can take multiple teams of deputies and stand you know have them on watch and they're watching the perimeter constantly uh, my thought was is that they were going to try to draw these things back in to a secure location and it would offer them a couple of things first off it would offer offer them a controlled environment in which to process these uh, structures, which look, I mean, as you well know, having been a prosecutor, you know that we take cars back to crime labs sure. all the time and, you know, and process those. And that's a car on a flatbed, right. on a flatbed. Right. And sometimes right. it'll still have bodies in them, you know, and that's, that's not unheard of. I've been involved in a lot of cases, but we're talking about mobile homes, big mobile homes that, you know, that they, they did this in. And, um, I was, I was just, you know, struck by this. I thought it was really a wild idea. I, I'm very anxious to see how all of this plays out and the nuances of it. Um, and, you know, the the bodies, the coroner did a fine job for, you know, he's like a, a local elected official. He's a, I think he's a general practitioner or something. He's not a forensic pathologist, but he did, he did an adequate job for what he had. You know, I mean, who, who gets up in, you know, early in the morning, this corner in some rural area, an agri-based area, and you're treating parents, I mean, patients, and all of a sudden your phone goes off and you said, you've got eight bodies in yeah. four different locations. Can you imagine? Yeah. And everybody knows these people. 
They just have, as of the recording today, they just have seated a jury. They've got alternates now. I think wow. they've got six alternates now. This thing's going to get rolling this yeah. week. The first of these cases, there's two guys to be tried that have not rolled over on this. And so that's going to be, uh, in my estimation, this is, and I'm biased because I've been following it for so long and I've been on the Pike Piketon Massacre podcast. Um this is the premier case of the year because there's wow. particularly from an investigative and a forensic standpoint uh, for you can't get you can't it's so rich with content and it is pure american gothic i mean just wow. right down to its core yeah well we will we will definitely continue to be following it i mean one of the things that we didn't even touch on is just kind of the uh what do you call it? The group psychosis to have yeah. an entire family decide, right. yeah, let's go, let's go ahead and murder all of these people in one night and let's plan it out. And I don't, I, I don't care how rural it is. That takes a tremendous amount of planning to have hit all four of those homes, it, it, you know, sequ sequentially. Just the, how do you, how does a family, how does, how does no one in that family say, wait a minute? Have we all lost our minds here? Do you know what I'm I saying? Know, and, like, and you know, the thing about it is apparently one vehicle is used. So you've got a team moving from dwelling to dwelling to dwelling. What in the hell do you talk talk about I don't, when you're I, on I don't, the way to the next exactly, one? Exactly. You know, are, are, you, are you taking the, this turn? Am I taking that turn? The, the horrors that you just witnessed at one scene now travel with you to three more scenes and yep. no one no one gets out of the car. Exactly. No, it's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, like I said, we will continue to follow it, but thank you for that r oh, really yeah, yeah. incredible no analysis of it. Yeah. Let's talk about a another case where there's some troubling handling of evidence, I guess you could say. Uh, we're talking about the murder of Tammy uh, Daybell, the first wife of Chad Daybell, 39-year-old Tammy Daybell, died October of 2019. The cause of death, death was originally deemed to be natural. However, shortly after Tammy's death, Chad married Lori Vallow. Lori Vallow's children later disappeared. And the bodies of Lori's children, JJ Vallow, seven years old, Tylee Ryan, 17, were later discovered at Chad Daybell's property. At the time, officers didn't consider Tammy's death suspicious and the Daybell children declined an autopsy of their mother. However, in December of 2019, Tammy's remains were exhumed after an investigation began into the disappearance of Lori's children. An autopsy was performed, but the details have not been publicly released. According to Tammy's son, Garth Daybell, authorities told the family she died of asphyxiation, but reportedly have not given more details to the family. The Daybell children continue to be supportive of Chad, claiming their bodies that bodies recovered on his property were placed there to frame him and arguing that the shallow graves would be uncharacteristic for Chad to dig. I love this as he had former experience as a grave digger. Chad and Lori allegedly shared extremist apocalyptic beliefs and that may have influenced the actions of the couple. Um, what's going on here? Talk to us first about how unusual is it to, I know an autopsy is not performed in every death, but I, what I'm curious about is if it was determined to be a, a asphyxiation, should there have been signs that someone should have said, you know what, maybe we should perform an, an autopsy here? Yeah, uh, yeah, you're, you're right. If the coroner had gone to the scene, Oh, tell us about that. Yeah, that's, <laughs> um, you know, when it came into us initially, uh, because, you know, we, JJ and Tylee were already missing, you know, so it was, it was already in the news, all right, and that, you know, they were looking for these children. And then when Tammy died, immediately, you know, everybody, all of us that were, you know, involved, you know, in the media and that sort of thing. And we're doing, a, you know, uh, analysis of, of these cases immediately. You know, we we began to, you know, look at this and think about, well, how how do you make this assessment? Because, you know, with Tammy, uh, one of the things that has constantly been, you know, put out there is the fact that she was healthy um, and she was, when she died at that time, she was training for a race 
like people said marathon. I don't think it was a marathon. I think it was like a half marathon or something, something like that. It was, it was a significant race. All right. Sure. It's not something that somebody would, some kind of heart condition or something would, you know, be engaged in. And she right. had no, no prior complaints. And she apparently was just beloved, you know, in the community. She worked as a media specialist for the local, one of the local schools. So all the kids knew her, you know, in the library and that sort of thing. And she'd been married to Chad for some time. But the morning, Chad had mentioned the night before he made the statement to the cops that she was coughing profusely or something like that. I don't know. It's very non, non-specific. Yeah. Um, that morning when she was discovered dead, um, he contacted the local PD, which was in, I think it's Rexburg, Idaho. And um, the kids actually went to the home and, uh, or were living at the home, there, Chad and, and Tammy's kids. And one of the children mentioned at that moment in time that she had a kind of a frothy edematous cone that was emanating either from her nose or her mouth. Now, for those that don't know, when you see this, many times this is, uh, you got something going on with your lungs, okay? Like it can be an airway issue, like uh, an asphyxial death. Uh, we see it a lot in like heroin ODs where the respiratory system is kind of suppressed. Uh, you'll see it in drownings. Uh, matter of fact, you'll, uh, when people are pulled that are dead or pulled out of the water, the cone will actually, it's kind of creepy when you see it, but the cone will actually present after the body has cleared the water. It, so something's going describe on. Describe what you're talking about, but it's like a It's foamy. a frothy, yeah, it's called a, just imagine like the head of a beer. Oh my God. And it's God. got, generally it's kind of got a pink tinge to it. And it's called a frothy edematous cone. And so you've got something from a respiratory standpoint that's going on. Yeah. And if somebody with medical legal training had seen that at that time, you would have said, oh, throw on the brakes, you know, we, something's going on here. There's a drug related issue, or I want to dig deeper into this to see if there's any signs of an asphyxial event or someone has been choked or, you know, suffocated or something like this, but that didn't happen at the scene. As a matter of fact, one of the deputies that was there uh, that rolled out to the scene actually made the statement that to them, everything appeared to be consistent with a natural death. And deputy you know, sheriffs or deputy deputy sheriff. And so, you know, my qualifier for that, as you can right. imagine, um, it's going to be, well, um, I'll put on a lawyer hat real quick, which I'm not a lawyer, but I would, you know, if, if you were on the, if you were on the stand, you know, I would, I'd make a comment like, oh, where'd you go to medical school? Right. You know, where'd right. You, where'd you, where'd you receive this training? You know, that you're, you're talking about now. Um, why is it that, you know, you can make this assessment? What qualifies you? to make this assessment because generally with police officers that go to the scene and God bless cops, some of my best friends, but a deputy sheriff in Rexburg, you know, Idaho is not qualified to make that assessment. Yeah. You know, uh, so, and, so and they, the thing about it is, is that once that bell is rung and again, we go back to this idea of the pristine scene. Uh, once you've taken the body out of that context, you've, You've lost everything. How is it that the coroner's office or medical examiner never got involved with this woman before she made it back to wherever her, her body was before they buried it? Yeah, apparently the body went to the local funeral home. And by law, you know, these, these people come from Utah. The whole family does, apparently. And so, and interestingly enough, you know how you mentioned that Chad was a grave digger at one point in time? Right. The graveyard that Tammy wound up being buried in is where he used to dig graves. Of, of course. I know, it's, it's mind-blowing. And right. so, uh, but, you know, the once you've crossed that bridge and when you transport a body across state lines, a body in most cases has to be embalmed. Okay. So they, without the corner, again, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but this no, is just, no, please. this is bothering me to the core of my kind of 
prosecutorial uh, uh, (laughs) hardwiring. But you're saying without a medical examiner or coroner's office, anybody getting involved, her body is taken directly to a funeral home, likely embalmed there, and then transported across state lines to where it was buried, even though we had all of these kind of surrounding circumstances that someone should have said, maybe we should take a look at how this woman died. Tell me how there was that breakdown. How does how does that how does that happen? That that is it just the 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 side effects of this kind of small uh, uh, town, or what what is it that it that leads to no one kind of stepping in and saying, wait a minute, we better follow follow protocol more closely here. Well, a lot of it has to do with the deferral of the local authorities to the wishes of Chad Daybell. Wow. Yeah, I know. Wow. And the thing but, about it is, you know, when by you the way, sworn, should be yeah. suspect number one from the get go, yeah, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, any, you know, I mean, you've been down this road long enough, Joshua, to know that, <laughs> you know, anytime you've got someone dead yeah. and they share a bed with you, yeah, uh, that's your numero uno. Uh, you, you were gonna. We we have to exhaust every possibility to check you off the list. You at least deserve a couple more questions beyond. Oh, she was coughing the night before. Well, everything checks out here. Yeah. Wow. And, and that's it's such a problem. Now, there's some indication the coroner may have seen the body at the funeral home, but again, you're. I don't know to what degree the body was examined at that point in time, um, and. The thing that has come back to me, and I haven't been able to verify this, is is it has been stated that Corner has limited funds and they're part time. And I'm thinking, okay, and this is one of the things that really irritates me. This is my own personal little soapbox. A lot of these, you know, city governments, and they're everywhere. They have they have time to throw money at things that are really nonsensical, as you <laughs> well know. You've worked in the government. But yet those that are literally the least defend, <laughs> defended and spoken for in our in our midst get they wind up with the the, the short end of the shaft. Matter of fact, Dr. Menyard, who was the coroner in New Orleans uh, many years ago, he famously in a documentary, he actually made a statement, put this up on the screen in big bold letters. This was actually a frontline documentary. He said, dead people don't vote. So what that means is is that you know um, you're going to take a back seat when it comes to funding and but this this comes down to common sense i can't imagine that in rexburg idaho at that particular time and moment that there was something more pressing than the death of a young woman and she's yeah. young yeah. and that you couldn't take just a few moments to just go, hey, dude. Just go draw, draw tox, draw blood. But no, that yeah. wasn't done. It, it, and really and once, good point. And then once you get, once you're embalmed, it's all over. But the crying at that point, because now you're going to embalm the body, and you're going to haul it south, and you're going to take the body down to Idaho, and then you're going to place the body in a coffin inside of a crypt, and you're going to leave it down there for a couple of months before the body is ever exhumed. Now, you know, the cool thing about Idaho is the fact that Idaho doesn't have coroners and coroners are great. All right, don't get me wrong. That's what, you know, you have coroners, you have medical examiners. It's a weird systems that we have all over the country. But in Idaho, they have a statewide medical examiner. There's no such thing as a coroner there. So, you know, and they're separate from law enforcement. They, They conduct their own investigations. Now, granted, this is not something that would be prosecuted, obviously. Uh, I know I'm preaching the choir. That's, this is, if there's malfeasance in Idaho, this is not something that's going to be prosecuted in, in Utah. But they have the ability to exhume these remains and do the, do the autopsy. I think that it's kind of interesting, though, that they've remained so tight-lipped about this as far as their findings. And they're playing very close to the vest. And it's very important that I think that everybody that's listening to us right now understand that this is not, <clears throat> this case, these cases are multi-jurisdictional. You know, the last time that anyone saw Tylee, I don't know if people remember this, you know where she was? She's on federal land. She was, a, she was at Yellowstone. I mean, that's the last time someone saw her. So automatically, if that's the case, 
you know, you you flip the Fed switch at that point yeah. in time. You've got them. You've got these weird things going on down in Arizona. You know, with with uh, uh, Lori's ex husband. You know, he's shot in the chest by her brother, who soon dies after all of this. And so you've got multiple jurisdictions that are involved in this thing. That's why it's such a a bizarre set of circumstances. Yeah. I've been covering this thing since it happened, and I, I'm still, you know, <laughs> I'm still, still dumbfounded by some of the stuff that I hear and things that, yeah. you know, kind of turn up, you know. Yeah. God, this one's heading to trial uh, soon too. Uh, so, yeah, I think uh, hopefully... it is. Uh, I want to say Christmassy time yeah. or the first of the year, you know, something like that. But it, it's been such a kind of a wackadoodle kind of thing with people yeah. going for mental health evaluations and. Uh, and changes of counsel and all that. I, yeah. I believe it when I see it. It's what, it, <laughs> you know, it's kind of what it comes I, down I, to for me. I just hope we get some of the answers to some of these questions. Oh, I, I do I'm, too. I'm like you. I don't want to throw law enforcement under the bus, but I am still dumbfounded oh, that, you know, that deputy's got a sergeant he answers to. And did that sergeant not say, Hey, maybe we maybe we better get somebody involved here to find out why this young woman just dropped dead out of nowhere before yeah. we just call this a natural death and move on. Incredible. Yeah, it, yeah, it really is. Turning to another bizarre case that it has not even um, been solved yet. Uh, let's talk about Katie Janice, who was 40 years old when she was killed in a public park in Atlanta while walking her dog Bowie on July 28th, 2021. Both Janice and her dog were stabbed to death. According to the medical examiner's report, Janice was stabbed 50 times in the attack. The assailant reportedly carved the word fat into Janice's chest. The victim was stabbed in the throat and suffered at least 15 stab wounds to the face. An autopsy report listed Catherine Janice's cause of death as sharp force injuries of her face, neck, and torso. The Atlanta Police Department also ordered an autopsy on Katie's dog, Bowie, to search for potential DNA that could have ended up on the dog. The brutality of the slaying shocked the local community and emphasized the need for greater security in Atlanta's parks. The case remains unsolved with no arrests or public suspects announced. The FBI is assisting in the ongoing investigation. Uh, Joseph, I, I'm not sure how much of your uh, it, 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 your time as a medical examiner, if you were ever asked to kind of understand by the nature of the killing what relationship that person may have had with the victim, but in it, it, you know, it doesn't. It can take an armchair kind of detective to understand that there was a lot of. It sounds to me like personal hatred involved in this when you've got stabbings to someone's face that many times a word carved into their chest i i know i i know i have a question in here somewhere but talk to that's us okay. about what all of all of that means to you and something that's always remarkable to me is that we use these terms like stabbed 50 times and we just kind of glance by it the amount of time that takes to do that yeah. and the amount of strength that takes to do that this is not you know, a butter knife into a slab of, of, of warm butter. This is a human being taking these many stabbings. Uh, I, I jump into it. Please uh -huh. share with us your thoughts on this. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know. I've had a few. Uh, first off, sharp force injuries and sharp force deaths are arguably the most brutal because it's you know, I guess somebody, you know, bludgeonings would run a close second, but there's something about using cold steel on somebody where it's very, very up close and personal uh, because you're, you know, people use the term, you know, you're in my space. And just imagine the most intimate, the intimate of interactions that you can have um, in, in this context uh, where you're burying a knife over and over again in a public park. And, you know, I know a lot of folks are not familiar with Piedmont Park, but it's a, um, it, it is, it is Atlanta Central Park, um, essentially, obviously not that big, but nonetheless, people walk their dogs through there. Uh, it has been kind of a haven for the homeless over the years. Um, I, you know, even during my days as an ME investigator, I worked a couple of homicides, but nothing, nothing that rose to this level at all. And I, I worked, 
you know, a couple of series of serial homicides in Atlanta, and I never saw anything this brutal associated with that. Uh, I think that first off, you have to think about the context in which this is happening. This is in a public place, and it's not too far off of a main main thoroughfare roadway, and it's at a crosswalk. So when she would have hit that crosswalk with the dog, taking the dog. Um, you know, for a nightly, you know, outing. Um, this is not something that she would have been unfamiliar with. It's a, it's a path that people regularly walk. It gives me, it, it, when I first read the autopsy report, which was striking to say the very least, it, it gave me pause to think this would have taken a considerable amount of time regarding the work. Um, yeah. The person would have been just, you know, in, in the heat of the deep south summer, okay, would have just been drenched in sweat. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's not just the environmental temperature, it's the adrenaline that's pumping. Uh, the madness that's at work, because you're talking about anger here. Um, and the dis the level of disfigurement, because um, one of the things that really stood out, Josh, was the fact that um, she had been partially disemboweled. And when you dig into the autopsy report, you realize that there are focal areas of hemorrhage in, in those loops of bowel that are hanging out, which gives you an indication that she was alive when this was going on. Oh so it, it has a level of, of horror and terror yeah. to it that I don't know that many people can really fathom. And it, it has not gotten as much press nationally as mm -hmm. I would have liked to have seen it have gotten because it's so over the top. It's so horrific. Um, and then, you know, this this verbiage where if if folks that are listening, watching will just envision um, her, the word fat is the tip of the knife has been taken and it's written from right right to left the letters are slightly offset and they're rather large letters. You know, it's not like these are tiny, you know, like a tiny little thing. Um, and it involves the lower chest and the abdomen. And so she was, and this is in addition to the other sharp force injuries that she had sustained. And then the facial disfigurement as well. And yeah, I mean, there's enough people that watch true crime out there to know that, you know, when you know, in the, the old term, you know, overkill uh, that, you know, we use and that people in media use all the time. But this is truly an example of this. You're trying to literally destroy somebody by, you know, because let's face it, you know, you and I are meeting, you know, like this, we're talking. This is how we identify ourselves. This is how yeah. we identify ourselves to our families and our loved ones. And you rob an individual of that. And I don't want to get too far out into the, you know, psychopathology weeds because it's not really my bailiwick but there are certain things that we look for as death investigators at a scene uh first off we try to marry it up with any other cases that might have similarities i gotta tell you man i haven't heard peep about that there yeah. there's there there were a few things that you got the impression at the beginning they were kind of reaching for and nothing really stuck at all like there's not been any other manifestation out there that rises to this degree of brutality um and so, so scary I, sorry to cut you off but I'm, I'm just thinking with what you're describing and like you said robbing her of her, her identity yeah, yeah. It, it, to, to me and again this isn't my bailiwick either but just trying to trying to put it all together of who would commit this type of crime you, you your choices are either somebody who knew her and hated yeah. her so much, yes. which you would think detectives have spoken to all those folks, Everybody. right? And, and and no one seems to fit the bill or a complete psychopath mm -hmm. who has committed this one murder and continues to walk the streets in Atlanta, which both things are, 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 are equally terrifying. They but, are terrifying. And then you think about the people that inhabit, just think just for a moment that those individuals that that inhabit that area they know this has happened trust me everybody knows this has happened yeah. and still no one has had the bracelets put on them at this point so you're thinking you know we're coming into fall there's gonna be musical festivals and all that kind of stuff that goes on in these parks you know and you're thinking 
Lord Jesus, man, uh, <laughs> you know, am I going to take my family out here? You right. know, do I want to go walk my dog at night? Right. You know, because if somebody, and, and this is another thing, just from an environmental standpoint, they were very, com- the perpetrator was very comfortable with this environment. They knew their way around it. Right. You know, they knew that, uh, well, I don't know that they could have anticipated that that the cameras were in the toilet and weren't working. Uh, but they knew that it was kind of a, a darkened area when you made that turn. So you've got instantaneously, you've got camouflage where you can lay in wait. And how would you know, you know, my big thing is how would you know that she was on the way? Because this is a personal attack, I think. Um, and you would maybe know her patterns you know, they always yeah. tell you to vary, vary your patterns, that sort of thing, for good reason. And you sit there and you think, well, my God, did somebody know she was going to take her puppy out for a walk that night? And they just, they knew the path that she took and they waited for her. But still to this point, you know, at least to my knowledge, what I know, because I don't have any in, inside information, um, uh, what, what kind of leads have they developed? And I'll be very interested to know what the behavioral sciences unit has come up with with the FBI. Oh, God. Uh, it, it, one thing that you said earlier on that is still the kind of a sticking point to me that I always try to emphasize when talking about these types of cases is you described it as the amount of work involved. And you're right, a, the, 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 the pure work of doing this horrific yes. thing on top of the weather, on top of the energy and all of that, this is not something that the person simply, you know, wipes the blade clean no, on no, the no, grass no. and walks oh. away casually. This person is going to look like a complete monster. I mean, we're talking about drenched in sweat and also likely drenched in blood. And then it's just what casually walking down the street in the middle of Atlanta and you're in your, okay. So the one set of cameras aren't working. Aren't there dozens of cameras everywhere watching us do everything? And that this person just vanished is just yeah, amazing. I, I had a conversation with uh, Cheryl McCollum, who many people will know in true crime. Uh, she runs the Cold Case Institute, and Cheryl's a friend of mine. And we were discussing this case. She's based out of Atlanta. <clears throat> Pardon me. And you know, we uh, we came up with kind of a uh, a Hollywood uh, reference here. We we both. Uh, thought you know do you remember the movie carrie you know where she has right. the blood dumped on her and right. i'm not saying it would have been that much but the perpetrator um would have had contact traces of blood all up and down their hands their arms because it's such a feverish event and you're using an instrument it's not like the, this was a morgue instrument or a surgical instrument that was used you know something that has a very fine blade on it and it's meant for this sort of thing uh, you're talking about a deployable knife, possibly, uh, maybe something along the lines, I don't know, a hunting knife or a buck knife. And, um, you know, every time you strike, um, people might not know this, but every time you strike with a knife, that edge becomes, it's lessened. Okay, so by right. the time you get up in that, that double digit number, right. now you're talking about utilizing a, a knife that is not the same weapon that you started off with. It right. requires more energy and you've you've sapped yourself of your energy by that time. Right. And 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 again, I, I think we're past the point of getting graphic on this, but we're, we're here we are. But you're now talking about a knife that is not only become dulled, but is the knife itself is likely soaked in blood. And therefore your grip on the knife is not yeah. as sure as it once was. And perhaps that person's even suffering injuries to their own hand themselves from that knife yes. in this kind of feverish moment. You're right. I don't know how this person could just disappear without someone somewhere going, you know, look at the injuries on so and so. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, that 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 has crossed my mind as well. And one of the other things I'm hoping that they did when they did the examination, I'm sure that they did knowing that office head to toe x-rays uh, on the body because with a knife like this you're going to lose little fine fragments and from a metallurgical standpoint that's something that if the person still possesses the knife and you can uh, if they were able to recover from a metallurgical standpoint any kind of shaving that was contained within the wound which can be difficult um, then you you've got a, a potential chemical tieback 
from a molecular tie back to the the blade that was a murder forged. weapon. Wow. And so, you know, we, we talk about ballistics and everything. People don't think about knives lots of times, but that has happened. It does happen. Um, and it's just a matter of being thorough. I'm sure that they were all hands on deck, though, when they were doing this examination. Incredible. Wow. Well, I, I, I hope to be reading the news that this person has caught someday because it's too. just just terrifying to know that that person still walks amongst us. Uh, Joseph, this was fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on this week. Uh, where can people find out more about you? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, you can check check me out. Um, my uh, my podcast is Body Bags with Joseph Scott Morgan. Um, it is a forensic based podcast. We thought for a time that perhaps, and I don't know, can't validate this, that I was the only uh, forensic scientist or one of the few forensic scientists that was actually hosting their own podcast. And uh, if, if not, I hope that there are more that, <laughs> that come out. But for right now, I know that I am. Uh, and I don't get off into the weeds with a lot of psychopathology and relationship you know, issues regarding crimes and all that. I talk about the forensics of cases. I generally try to stay, stick with stuff that's recently been adjudicated or has that's recently in the news. I think today, the Courtney uh, Cleaney case, the uh, OnlyFans model case, I, I dropped yep. it today. Um, and so uh, you can find that on iHeart, Apple, Spotify, uh, Audible, and you know wherever you get your podcast, we're out there. You can find me on Law and Crime and uh, Court TV. I think I'll be on Court TV tomorrow night talking about the Piketon case. Uh, and then at Jacksonville State University, um, you know, where I'm a professor there. So I pop up in a lot of places. That's fantastic. I can't wait to uh, listen to that episode on your podcast. Yeah, sure. And I'm your host, Josh Ritter. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Joshua Ritter ESQ. You can find our sidebar episodes wherever you get your podcasts. And we want to hear from you. If you've got questions or comments you'd like us to address, tweet us your questions with the hashtag TCD sidebar. And thank you for joining us at the True Crime Daily sidebar. <laughs>